Hey guys, I know it's been a while and I apologize for that, but today we are going to talk about breeding discoid roaches. I have learned a lot since I started and I figured I should make an updated breeding guide. But first, I want to mention that I have a Facebook community that is slowly growing, Casey's Mealworms, Superworm, and Discoid Roach Knowledge Center. If you are new to the channel, consider subscribing. I cover a range of topics and breeding guides for feeder insects. And with that out of the way, let's start the video. Let's start off with the enclosure. You can use a number of containers, preferably something like a storage bin. Depending on the size of your colony and how big you want it to grow, you can either select a small or large container. It is up to you. Anything with a little bit of height will work. What I have done here is cut some holes in the top and place the screen in to allow for airflow and to help combat flies entering the colony. The next thing you need are egg crates. This is to provide more surface area for the colony and some comfort for your roaches, as they need a place to feel secure. Arrange the egg crates how you like, but try to opt for the greatest amount of surface area possible. This is how I had mine set up before my colony got large. This is how I do it now. I have tried to maximize the surface area within the bin to accommodate more roaches, but again, do what works best for you and your situation. Let's move on to heat and humidity. Discoid roaches need a warm, humid environment. You should use a heating pad with a thermostat under the enclosure, preferably on the side where you have the egg crates, to help create a hot area where they spend most of their time. A thermostat is going to prevent the heating pad from getting too hot and cooking your roaches. Like most insects, warmth is a key factor in their metabolism. The warmer they are, the more energy they have to do things, like breeding, gestating nymphs, and general growth. The ideal temperature that I have found for the colony is around 90 Fahrenheit, or 32 Celsius. This is neither too hot nor too cold for them. They can withstand higher temperatures. This is just what I have found to be a happy medium that is safe for them. Humidity should be between 40 and 50%. If you live in a drier climate, you will have to pay more attention to this. Luckily, I live in a very humid state, so it is a lot less of a pain for me personally. Some people suggest using a substrate, such as Coca-Core or EcoEarth, but I have personally found it is far more annoying than it is beneficial. If I were to use a substrate now, I would suggest some organic potting soil, like from Kellogg's Garden Organics. I originally purchased this for my isopods. It is a lot finer of a material, will hold moisture good, and will be easier to collect roach nymphs from when you are ready. The issue I have found with using Coca-Core or EcoEarth is that the fibers are generally long and build up in the sifter when you are trying to collect your harvest. Using a substrate can also end up growing mold under or around the food dish. Roaches are messy eaters, and they often dig around in their food and end up spreading it around. Where there is food and moisture, there is mold. If this does not bother you, then go right ahead. Anyhow, the whole point of using a substrate is to retain moisture in the enclosure, raising the humidity. Nymphs and adults will dig around in it as well. You should give your colony a hefty spray down periodically. I personally spray my colony three times a week, but I do not use a substrate, so there is little to no water retention. You could very well get away with once or twice a week using a substrate, but again, this all depends on your climate and the average humidity in your area. Try to maintain the temperature and humidity as best as you can. Now let's talk a little bit about food. There are a variety of roach towels available, but they can be extremely expensive compared to how much you get and how fast your roaches consume it. I have tried a few times in the past to make a roach towel that is suitable, but the roach breeding community has given me a bit of backlash over it. I have learned cat and dog foods are looked down on due to their nutritional value and high protein. I have since avoided using those materials. Recently, I have moved over to using pig and rabbit food. The average protein is about one third of what is found in cat and dog foods, which range from 30 to 40 percent. Pig and rabbit food are plant-based, have lots of fiber, and are low in calcium. They consist mostly of flax seed, alfalfa meal, wheat middlings, and oats. The protein content sits around 12 percent, which is much lower than what I have made in the past. As you can see, this is an example of a roach towel made by dubiaroaches.com. It consists of mostly the same materials. This is an example of a bulk bag of pig food. There are some differences, but none that should make a massive difference, and it will save you a lot of money in the long run compared to buying roach chows. This is entirely up to you. Let's move on to wet foods. I prefer to use items like kale, collard greens, tangerines, or oranges for my breeding colony. Your roaches should be getting most of their nutrients from the roach chow you prepare or buy. However, do not discount how important good veggies are for them. Do note, for feeders, I highly suggest skipping citrus, like tangerines and oranges, due to it being toxic to some reptiles. I only use citrus items for my breeding colony. On to the water source. This part is very simple and very cheap. Simple water jellies that can be bought off Amazon are picked up from a local store. They sometimes can be found in the gardening section. You can keep rehydrating them by filling the water bowl back up every few days to keep the water jellies full of water. 
The breeding aspect is the most simple part. You just want to have males and females. Big shock. It is preferable to have more females than males, but starting off, you shouldn't worry about any kind of ratio. My breeding colony is a few hundred strong at this point, and I have set a ratio of roughly one male for every three females. You may be able to get away with four or five females for every one male. However, I am playing it on the safe side and keeping the ratio cut down a bit. I keep extra male roaches in a separate enclosure and feed them off to my tarantula, or give them away as feeders for larger reptiles like bearded dragons. The reason I prefer to keep my colony this way is to cut down on the food requirements and save space within the enclosure for more females, which will lead to an increased production. This part is completely optional, but it allows you to be more hands-on with your colony and I personally enjoy it. Let's cover sexing real quick. Females have a dark underbelly and a singular large plate at the end of the abdomen, like this. Males have a lighter colored underbelly and segmented plating at the end of the abdomen, like this. Females typically weigh more than males do and are generally larger. Some females are on the petite side, but for the most part, they can be told apart by size. The most accurate, though, is using the previously mentioned method of checking the underbelly. Let's take a moment to talk about when we should expect our first nymphs. I haven't exactly timed this myself, however, I have a general idea. Once mating has occurred, the female will gestate a clutch of nymphs for about one and a half to two months before giving birth to 20 to 30 nymphs. It will feel like it takes forever to get your first clutch, but once your numbers get high enough, you will constantly be having female roaches bearing young every few days. Roach nymphs will feed on most things, like moist food and roach towel. They will also eat frass, which is roach poop, as it can help build gut bacteria and is readily accessible to them. So do not worry about frass buildup, it is a good thing and creates no odor. One thing I can say that is positive about discoid roaches is that they basically have no smell, no matter how much frass there is. Lastly, the expected time it takes for nymphs to become adults. It can take around 5 months, give or take. Your nymphs will molt often, and you will find little sheds all throughout the enclosure. You can leave them or pick them out by hand, but depending on how many nymphs you have, this can quickly become a very tedious endeavor, and I personally do not find it worthwhile. I only collect the sheds when I am about to harvest my breeding bin, and save them for my isopods. And that about does it guys. If you like this video and have it in your critter-loving heart, give me a like, a subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more videos in the future like this. And as always, from the gizzards and I, have a wonderful day.